I want to welcome you to Hawthorne University's award-winning Holistic Health and Nutrition webinar series, and I really thank you for attending today's presentation on drug-nutrient botanical interactions, the interconnected web of healing with Dr. Bianca Grilli. Dr. Grilli, I'm just so thrilled to have you back with us and presenting for us again today. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me, Paula. I really appreciate it. You know, we always receive terrific information from you, so as usual, we're going to record this presentation and it'll be available for replay on our website in just a few days. And we'll also save time at the end of this presentation for question and answers, so just write them into the, to the um, webinar panel at any time and I'll present them for you at the end. And I'm your host, Paula Bartholomew. I'm one of the founders of Hawthorne. So let me get us started with an intro into today's topic and for our presenter. Today we're focusing on botanical medicine, which is also referred to as plant medicine, phytotherapy, and herbalism. It's been practiced by humans for thousands of years. And so this webinar touches on the deep history of plant medicine and explores its relationship with the new to the scene pharmaceutical medications. The interactions between herbs and drugs can be both detrimental and advantageous depending on the variety of factors, particularly the combinations of herbs and drugs being utilized. So today we'll learn how herbs can support the use of pharmaceutical medications in the human body and which combinations should be used cautiously or avoided altogether. Dr. Bianca is a former U.S. Marine turned naturopathic doctor, and she received her undergraduate degree in biology from the University of Maryland and her doctorate in naturopathic medicine from Bastyr University. Dr. Grilly has been on staff at the Susan Samueli Center for Integrative Medicine at the University of California, Irvine, and volunteer clinical faculty at their medical center. She was the Director of Lifestyle Medicine at the Institute for Restorative Health in Davis, California. And then in 2012, she established her private practice in Northern California, which focuses on the prevention and treatment of chronic illness in all age groups through the effective use of natural and lifestyle medicine approaches. In addition to her private practice, Dr. Grilly is a consultant for the Institute of Functional Medicine and for Metagenics. She's also a member of the Speakers Board Bureau for Metagenics. One of her passions is teaching, and as such, she's faculty member of Hawthorne University, where she teaches in the Masters of Holistic Nutrition program. She also loves to write and frequently publishes in various healthcare journals and publications. Dr. Grilly is the current president and founding board member of the California chapter of the Children's Heart Foundation and sits on the national board for this foundation. She lives in beautiful Northern California with her husband, two very active children, four backyard chickens, and a newly added dog. She loves to read, cook, garden, and preserve fresh produce to enjoy year-round. You know, isn't this just what we all want from our doctors? <laughs> I do. <laughs> all right, Dr. Bianca, if you're ready, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Paula. I appreciate that. So thank you everyone for being on the webinar today. Thank you for Hawthorne for allowing me to present this material. Um, I do really love what I do as a naturopathic doctor, and um, some of the most important things to me are staying really connected with nature, whether that be in my backyard garden, uh, outside walking, uh, in our local area we have hiking opportunities, water opportunities, and so really getting our hands in the dirt and back into nature um, I think is very profound, and so this particular webinar was very exciting for me to create because it allowed me to start looking again at the botanicals that we use from both a naturopathic and a nutritionist standpoint and from our uh, holistic medicine side of things and to really dig deep and say, you know, if, if more people were to utilize herbal medicine and botanical medicine, what things might they need to know? So again, I'm looking forward to presenting this material and for any questions that you might have afterwards. So we'll get started today. Let's see if I can figure this out. There we go. As Paula mentioned, um, here's a description of what we'll be going through today. But as you probably know, botanical medicine is nothing new. It's actually been practiced by humans for thousands of years, um, probably actually maybe even longer. Um, humans have relied on plant medicine for, or plants for food, for shelter, as well as medicine. And obviously it's proved very valuable for us for our survival since the beginning of time. 
In order to effectively and safely, however, use plants, we really need to understand quite a bit about them. We need to understand their energies, whether it's through a book that we learn this material or whether it's hands-on learning that we learn this material. We need to understand more about their chemical properties, how they interact with one another. Uh, we also need to understand the contraindications for using these particular plant medicines, potential side effects, what to watch for. And then the topic of our, our webinar today, the interactions between drug, nutrients, and botanical uh, compounds. This webinar will touch on that rich history, but I highly recommend that if you do love botanical medicine uh, the way I do and the way a lot of our practitioners do, that you really delve into it over the next while uh, as you can through books and like I said, hands-on learning. We'll also explore the relationship uh, for botanical medicines to the quote, new to the scene pharmaceutical medications. And we'll look at both the advantages and possibly the harmful interactions that can occur between these two forms of medicine. When you're done today, hopefully you'll come away with a newfound appreciation for the healing wisdom that botanical medicine can bring both to your practice, to your patients, your clients, and your home life, while also exploring the cautionary and the wise use of herbs in various situations. So as I was talking to Paula before we started this webinar today, um, I hope you'll enjoy the prints that you'll see, the botanical prints that you'll see through, scattered throughout the webinar uh, pages. And each of these, for the most part, were pulled from a free access database that you can um, easily tap into. It's from the New York Public Library. And the last slide, I believe, will give you a link to that. Um, but there's some just beautiful prints Hopefully you'll be able to utilize them in future webinars or for teaching and learning yourself. So the objectives of our webinar today, as we said, is to review quickly the ancient history of plant medicines. We'll examine the biased elimination of botanical medicine from Western medicine. And then we'll also look at how it's resurgence in, resurgence in current times. We'll discuss the various ways that botanical medicine is currently being used in US healthcare. And then we'll get into the aspects of really looking at how drug, botanical, and nutrient interactions can happen and what to be aware of, exploring some of the most common scenarios. And we'll also look today at the drug and nutrient depletion um, situations that might occur as you're working with your clients. So jumping into the beautiful history of plants as medicine. Uh, scientists and researchers have found that plants have actually been used as, as medicine as far back as 60,000 years ago in Iraq. And they found at the site of a Neanderthal man, uh, man's burial site. This was uncovered in the 1960s. And buried with him were eight different species of plants. And what the scientists found were some of these plants are still medicinally used today in various regions throughout the world. So whether they were actually buried with him for um, medicinal purposes or spiritual purposes, we do know that they were utilizing plants within their culture uh, for a variety of different um, opportunities. We also know that in China, herbal medicine was used as, uh, er as far back as 8,000 8, years ago with the earliest known record, written record uh, from the third century BC. And this, you've probably heard of the Yellow Emperor's Classic of Internal Medicine book. And this was written as a dialogue actually between the emperor and his minister. And it touches on topics of health and the art of healing. So much information was passed down through this document, which is actually the oldest known document in Chinese medicine. Um, and honestly, this is the, the basis that started the today's concept of TCM or traditional Chinese medicine. Over 5,000 years ago, written records show that the Sumerians were using different medicinal plants such as laurel, caraway, and thyme as part of their, pra their practices. And I wanted to throw this next piece in here because I found it quite fascinating. Um, there is written record back 1500, from 1500 BC of burn, a burn care recipe. And the recipe itself actually utilizes natural and readily available ingredients, but they don't just use one specific ingredient um, or several, but they use it in different combinations over a time period. So I'm gonna show you this here because I think it's, like I said, very fascinating. So if you wanna tap into this website, you'll be able to see it for yourself and read more on it. 
but the burn care recipe from 1500 BC. On day one, if you have a burn, you should put black mud on it. On day two, you should have a mixture of dung of calf with yeast. The third day, you would use dried acacia resin with barley paste, cooked colocynth and oil. And colocynth is in the right-hand picture at the bottom of your screen. And that's a cousin or within the family of the cucurbitaceae family. So that's your cucumbers and your melons, squashes. Day four, you, have your, you will put paste of beeswax, fat, and boiled papyrus with beans on the burn. And hopefully by day five, it seems like things are starting to improve and you have another mixture of colocynth, red ochre leaves, and copper fragments. So I'd venture to guess if we actually went into the uh, constituents of some of these plants and the um, particular ingredients in this recipe that we would actually find that there is specific reasons now that we understand that each of these ingredients were, could be used to support uh, burn treatment. So if anybody wants to do that, I would love to find out what you find out as you do the research on this. When we talk about plants as medicine, we have to understand there's probably going to be a variety of different voc vocabulary words used um, to describe this. So you might hear herbalism, botanical medicine, phytomedicine, or phytotherapy. But it's really the healing practice of utilizing the herbs, the herbal materials, and the herbal preparation, as well as the finished herbal products um, within the practice uh, utilizing their active ingredients. We can use plants as medicine or botanical medicine to prevent, treat, and cure a variety of health conditions. And plant medicine, as we've already seen, has been incorporated throughout history in a variety of different medical systems to include TCM, Ayurvedic medicine, and naturopathic medicine. The WHO, uh, the World Health Organization, published um, a paper showing that during our present time right now, an estimated 75 to 80% of the world's population still relies on medicinal plant preparations for part of or for their primary health care needs. And I thought this was fascinating because I think we do see this as we um, watch the news or we travel, we do see that this is still being utilized in many other countries. We don't see as much of it in our country here in the United States However, if we dig into the history a little bit more, we actually find that as late as the 1890s, that up to 59% of the products in the US pharmacopoeia were based on herbs or herbal combinations. So that we can see that actually 120 years ago, people here even in our country were predominantly utilizing, I shouldn't say predominantly, a, a majority, 59% of what they were utilizing was coming from our plant or botanical medicine toolkit. And another really interesting database, um, love for you to take a look at this. I think you'll find it fascinating also of the US pharmacopoeia. This one is a, a snapshot from 1851. And I took some time when I was putting together this presentation to flip through because you can flip the pages when you're on the, in the database to flip through this particular um, edition uh, in 18, that was published in 1851. And on virtually every page that you turn to, you see some form of plant, plant being used for med medicinal purposes. So for example, right here on this page, we see that we have ginger, uh, tincture of ginger on the upper left-hand side. On the bottom left-hand side, we have, have sarsaparilla. And on the right side or on the right page there, you see a fluid extract of senna. So all three plants, right there in our U.S. Pharmacopoeia from 1851. So now we're going to jump into a little bit of why we might not be utilizing plant medicine as much now as we did just 100 to 120 years ago. And it's quite unfortunate that the practice of botanical medicine and virtually all other forms of CAM, which is the complementary and alternative medicine, um, which actually now is called the complementary and integrative medicine, these were nearly shut down in their entirety or eliminated at the turn of the century. So we ask ourselves, why did this happen? And many of you have, might have heard of the Flexner Report. And this report was an influential report, uh, which the US science administrator and politician, Abraham Flexner, he wrote this in 1901. 
and he was paid to do so by the Carnegie Foundation. Um, and when it was published, and I actually have to take you back, Abraham Flexner was an educational theorist and transformation uh, expert. He actually had no medical training. And the first time he actually walked into a medical college was to begin the research for this particular report. And when the report was published in 1910, uh, it put a real damper on the complementary and integrative medical modalities that were being practiced and trained for in the, in the United States medical colleges. Uh, Abraham Flexner, he recommended in his report that all of our medical colleges be science-based, which I have no issue with, standards models, and what he said was we needed to model it after a particular German scientific approach that had been popular in Europe at that time. What it did, however, was that between 1910, when, it, when this report was published, and in 1935, was it closed over half of all American medical schools uh, in our country. And the majority of those that were closed or that had to merge with other colleges were those that were training chiropractors, DOs, naturopathic doctors, holistic practitioners, uh, homeopathic practitioners. And unfortunately, we did lose a lot of this curriculum during those 25 years. It did, however, of course, bring another Op, uh, I'm sorry, another um, healthy aspect to the curriculum, which was we did begin to have a uniformity of the curriculum in medical schools across the country. So there were some good things that came of this report, but as I said, unfortunately, it did eliminate virtually all non-medical practitioners in schools uh, to the detriment of a lot of our holistic practices and um, curriculum. So that really was the start of med the medicine and healthcare system that we know of today, which is virtually all focused on pharmacy prescriptions and this new medical paradigm. There was a report that was published in 2010 and it's called 100 Years After the Flexner Report, Reflections on its Influence on Chiropractic Education. And this quote I think really uh, epitomizes what happened when we moved away from having a more holistic approach to our medical training and uh, treatment modalities. With the new paradigm of scientific medicine, the body began to be conceptualized in terms of systems unrelated to other systems of the body. And although specialization had been present in the context of whole body medicine, specialization under scientific medicine began to emphasize individual systems or organs to the exclusion of the totality of the body. And I think that's where we really lost a lot of our uh, wonderment of the natural world and bringing it into our practices and utilizing it within our homes. And what I hope to show you today is that really, we are really turning a corner on that. And we're, we're moving forward with a lot of new interest and a resurgence of botanical medicine within our healthcare system. And so I find that uh, very encouraging and I hope you do too. What we're seeing is that there has been this rise within the complementary and integrative medical world, and there's a variety of reasons for that. First of all, we found that although chemical drugs and pharmaceuticals definitely have a place within our medical paradigm now, that there are often side effects. And many practitioners, as well as patients, either prefer to not have the side effects and try something natural, and or they decide that they will move forward with the pharmaceuticals, but would like to mitigate some of those side effects from a natural standpoint. There's also, in certain cases, lack of efficacy in some of the medications and prescriptions that we're utilizing. So again, in, in many cases, we find that there might be a natural alternative that can uh, take the place or support that particular medication. We're also finding, and we hear all the time about the microbial resistance happening in, in many cases. And then the pharmaceutical companies themselves have seen both a need and have heard the desire of the public to invest more of their time and money into research and development of plant medicine. And I think that's a really great place for us to, to start focusing on is that the pharmaceut if the pharmaceuticals can support more of this R&D in, in plant medicine, I think we will continue to see some of this resurgence of using natural approaches to healthcare. So they are putting more of their science and their technology and their ideas 
to rediscovering the herbs as potential sources of new drug candidates, as well as utilizing them um, in other aspects. And then there's a renewal of strategies to favor the development and discovery of, quote, novel natural product drugs. So of course, we know that these have been around for, for years and, and centuries, um, but to the pharmaceutical world, these are new approaches. The NHIS, which is the National Health Interview Survey, and they, this survey monitors and has monitored the health of the nation since 1957 through various surveys and questionnaires. The publication they put out in 2012 showed that in fact, complementary health approaches are being utilized by about a third, a little bit over a third of the US adults and over 11% of US children. So we know that, again, this is being utilized. We're seeing it more and more in everyday practices and in everyday routines. The most commonly used complementary approach was, were natural products. Uh, this is dietary supplements other than vitamins and minerals. So we really are talking about some of these uh, botanical medicines in this case. And as you can see on the right-hand side, uh, the, the global nutraceuticals market is actually expected to reach $403 billion by 2024. So I don't believe it's going away. I think this is a great place for us to be and to learn this uh, approach and to really use it efficaciously as well as safely. Now the nutraceuticals market report went on to say that these products are being used in, in um, single form, single product form, as well as combination forms but they're also being used quite highly in fortifications of personalized products. So this might mean you buy an energy drink that has B-complex and caffeine uh, from green tea in it, or you might find that you uh, purchase a, a um, yogurt and it has probiotics in it, or you might buy a drink and it has CoQ10 in it. So that we are utilizing some of these nutraceuticals and supplements in maybe they're not most natural form, but they are being utilized and they're coming to the forefront of research and awareness uh, within the U.S. general population. Because there are, is such an interest and increased understanding that botanical medicines can be and should be utilized within our healthcare system, I believe that for practitioners of holistic medicine in any form, we really do need to understand how to use them, like I said, efficaciously as well as safely. So we know there's over 53,000 species of plants that are being used uh, in a botanical medicine approach. These are in single and combination formulas. They might be used in their raw form, but they also have a whole slew of different formulations that can be utilized based on what the patient's needs are, as well as their ability to either afford or swallow or take or utilize the particular formulations. And you can see here, there's the ones that we might uh, most commonly use and see capsules and tablets, um, liquid formulas and powders. And then there's others, poultices, homeopathic preparations and suppositories. And you can also see that in most cases, depending on the plant, um, you can use a wide variety of plant parts for the medicine. And as you get deeper into botanical medicine, you'll find that each of these plant parts will give you a different either energetic or chemical compound um, uh, formulation. So it's really helpful and necessary to understand which part of the plant to use and how to create that particular formulation. This is just, a, I thought the pictures were really beautiful. Paula, I couldn't help but put these in because I thought it was so exciting again to see so many different forms of herbs and to remember they really do come from outside, from the garden, from nature, from the forest. And, and, and these are herbs that are used for so many different purposes. Just right here on these five different herbs, Hawthorne, St. John's wort, golden seal, lavender, and turmeric, we can find that there's antioxidant properties, anti-inflammatory properties, anti-anxiolytics. So we're looking at uh, for reducing anxiety. There's um, chemical properties that will help with depression. There's also properties in here for heart health and for immune system and infection. So just within these five botanicals here, you have a slew of different uh, constituents that will support different aspects of healing and prevention. 
So as you can see, this botanical resurgent re resurgence really is happening. And to me, that is so very exciting. But again, it comes with a responsibility. So if we are to start using botanical medicines more for our clients and our patients and within our practices, it's really important for us to know how to utilize them. We're also seeing that this resurgence is happening within the government, within public sectors, and also within private sectors. NIH, the National Institutes for Health, has published a um, database where you can go in and see different herbs and you can learn about their common names, their Latin names, you can find out where they grow, what they're utilized for, some of their contraindications and safety components. If we look at it from a research standpoint, we can see just right here from this 2016 review article that they're looking at the botanicals and their bioactive phytochemicals for women's health. So we're utilizing them for research and then hopefully from, from the lab into actual clinical practice. Herbs and botanical medicine are being looked at and utilized in many cases, either as cancer therapy or as adjunctive treatment uh, to support the, the actual first line cancer therapies. We're also seeing from a government perspective uh, that they are investing money and research into non-opioid alternatives to pain. Uh, that's obviously for a variety of reasons. And so this article, 2018, highlights various herbs that were studied in this particular uh, review, as well as saying that there is a place for herbal medicines. If you look at the last line here, uh, it says, in conclusion, this review suggests that some herbal plants can be suitable candidates for the treatment of neuropathic pain. So again, we're seeing a resurgence of research and of utilization um, in many, many areas. And then, of course, you can take botanical classes and webinars, and you can learn more like you're doing today. There's actual um, a degree programs, such as Bastyr University, which offers the Bachelor of Science in Herbal Medicines. We can find botanical medicines and gardens in hospitals and homes now. And this, I, I wanted to highlight this. I, I saw this particular speaker um, at the AIHM conference this past weekend. And this gentleman from the Rodale Institute was highlighting a partnership that the Rodale Institute has created with the St. Luke's Hospital System in Pennsylvania, where they're now providing garden grown or farm grown food from their St. Luke's farm to patients at the hospital. And we can only hope that maybe in there, they're also planning some, bot some botanical uh, components. Maybe they won't utilize them for medicine, but maybe they will be in a vase somewhere. And maybe the lavender will help with some of the anxiolytic components. So I think there's, there's we're, we're making movement and we have so much room for growth here. We also, of course, know that they're being used as supplements and in the natural health industry. So as I was saying, if we're going to use these and we have the potential to use these and we know that botanical medicine has a place in our medical healthcare system, then we need to know what we also need to either warn or caution our, our clients and patients on when we're recommending these supplements and these botanical medicine components so that we are doing this safely. So what I want to take you through next is maybe not as glamorous as some of the other things that we just looked at, but really getting into the systems of where we need to keep our focus when we are making recommendations for botanicals and or what we need to be aware of when our patient and client comes into our office and they are already on medications. So we forget sometimes that it's not just us who is making recommendations in a vacuum. There's typically several other practitioners who are also involved in a client, client's care, and that might be their medical, their primary medical provider, it might be an acupuncturist, it might be another nutritionist, it might be a chiropractor, but often there are multiple inputs to uh, prescriptions as well as recommendations for supplements and nutrients and botanical medicines. So I think we need to be aware that there's multiple areas where interactions can occur. We're going to talk a couple of we're going to talk about a couple of examples for drug nutrient interactions, and we're also going to talk about several drug botanical interactions. These are only examples, and the three examples I will be giving you and that we'll be going over today are um, they're very common. You'll see them quite often in practice, but remembering that it's only the tip of the iceberg. 
And in order to do this safely, we really need to understand what our resources are and really looking at each and every individual client and patient to ensure there are no interactions as we make these recommendations. So drug nutrient interactions, there are several mechanisms in which this might play out. We can see the interaction happening at a transport and absorption level through the carrier and binding proteins. We can also see it happening through enzymatic processes, which would affect the bioavailability of sometimes, usually it's the, the drug or the pharmaceutical, but sometimes it's also the nutrient uh, that we are recommending that might be affected by the enzyme interaction there. And then also a, a big component and a big um, category would be the metabolism of drugs, which would go through the liver enzymes, the CYP450 enzymes. Now these interactions can happen throughout the body, whether it's in the blood, the brain, the liver, the kidneys, or, or particularly in the gut. Most of you have probably heard that there's warnings surrounding drinking grape juice along with several different medications. And so what we'll look at here is that grapefruit juice itself can actually have an impact on medication, various medication in different ways, depending on which medication it is. So you may have a medication on board that if your client drinks grapefruit juice in, in higher quantities, it's not just a small amount, but in higher quantities, that it could block an enzyme or an enzymatic process that would actually lead to having too much of that pharmaceutical medication in the body. And so that could obviously have some uh, detrimental side effects to the patient. We also see that it could impact a different kind of medication in a different way. And in, in, in this aspect, it could block the transport of the actual medication itself, leaving too little of the medication to be absorbed and utilized by the body. And then in that case, the drug just would not be as efficient for that patient. So in, for grape juice, juice, grapefruit juice, there are actually several different uh, medication groups that it can impact to include the various cardiovascular or hypertensive medications of the calcium channel blockers, the beta blockers, the angiotensin II receptor blockers, and then also anti-cancer agents and the uh, ubiquitous statins. This is a 2010 uh, article, it's again, beautiful pictures, just to explain to us how this might be happening. And so this particular article and research um, trial looked at how, or, or did grapefruit juice actually interact with warfarin? And so this slide shows you the actual details of how that might be happening. And their conclusion was in fact, that grape juice, grapefruit juice, especially in large quantities would it could be plausible in creating an interaction with warfarin. So I just wanted to show you that there's actually studies coming out that show how some of these things happen, what the mechanisms are. So you shouldn't be at a loss for finding resources and references to be able to review what your patients and clients are taking, what they're eating, and what you might want to recommend. So the literature is definitely available. And in this case, what they found was that grapefruit juice does increase what's called the INR, so the bleeding time. So clotting goes, clotting time is increased and it could re, uh, lead to increased bleeding uh, for this particular patient if they cross the two uh, components. Looking at drug botanical interactions, uh, a botanical or herb that many people are familiar with is St. John's wort or Hypericum perforatum. And this is typically used for depression as well as menopausal symptoms. And if you go to the database online, I believe this is from um, drugs.com, you'll see that there's a wide variety of possible interactions between St. John's wort and multiple, multiple categories of medications. So this would be one that's high on your list of red flag. When you want to recommend St. John's wort to someone, you would absolutely start to take a look at what medications they might have on board, but you would also want to warn them because let's say you did tell, give your, your client a recommendation for St. John's wort and they moved out of the state and they weren't able to come back and see you again you don't know that down the line, they may not add some of these medications to their regimen. So again, it's really important to educate the people that we're also seeing and making these recommendations for. 
slippery elm. Um, this is used as a carminative, so for the GI tract as well as for colds and respiratory issues. And this also has multiple different drug botanical interactions. So we might think that slippery elm is just very, um, uh, that there are no interactions or contraindications or issues that, that we would recommend here. But in fact, what we want to watch for is it kind of coats the GI tract, if you will, because it's a demulcent and um, it's similar to other mucilaginous agents that it could actually prevent or delay some of the absorption of other substances, particularly drugs in this case that we're concerned about, or even food. So again, it's not something that's maybe high on your list of knowing right off the top of your head if somebody comes in with slippery elm, but if they're having issues with their medication or they're having issues with nutrients, it would be something that you consider. So again, this is more about creating awareness as practitioners so that we think through all of the different components when we are either making recommendations or we see a patient coming in on particular supplements or medications. This next section is going into the drug nutrient depletion opportunity or potentials that you may see when a patient comes in on different medications. So if recall, you recall what we did just a few minutes ago over the past few slides, we were looking at the drug botanical interactions and the drug nutrient interactions. But now we're going to look at how certain medications might actually deplete some of the nutrients that we might be recommending in a diet. So here again, it's really important that we have the knowledge and awareness and be able to do some of the research if we don't have the answers right at our fingertips. And it's also very important that we create some educational components for our patients so they also are aware of the potential interactions. Now, if we think that there are some issues with a medication that our patient is taking and that we think it might be creating some nutrient deficiency, there's a couple different ways we can manage this. Number one, we can do some lab testing, look at the results, or we can also partner with a practitioner if that's not within our scope, and we can do ask for additional lab testing. We can look at signs and symptoms. So there are a variety of different resources where you can learn more about looking at fingernails, looking at um, tongues, looking at skin, eyes, et cetera, to learn the signs and symptoms of, of particular nutritional deficiencies. Those are part of the physical findings. And then of course, if we do feel that there is a nutrient depletion based on a drug, we're not gonna take the patient off the drug necessarily, but we are going to start working on their nutritional aspect and referring as appropriate. As we look at how some of these interactions might take place, how a drug nutrient depletion situation might occur, there's various ways. For example, a patient might be on a medication that reduces their appetite or their taste sensation is diminished, in which case their appetite is also diminished. And in this case, maybe they don't eat the nutrients they need, and again, they're deficient. We might have a nutrient loss, such as a particular diuretic. It may deplete their potassium stores. Or in fact, we might actually have a decrease in nutrient production. So this would be the case of particular antibiotics that might kill certain intestinal flora that was helping to actually extract nutrients from the food, such as in the case of vitamin K. So again, there's a myriad of ways that this might take place. Uh, depletions can happen because of the interactions uh, through absorption, the actual synthesis of vitamins and nutrients, transport, storage, metabolism, and excretion. So as healthcare providers, we know that health problems are rarely a, come from a single issue. They're typically multifactorial, they're often complex, and we look at the whole picture as practitioners. We look at their diet, stress, sedentary lifestyle. Those are the first things we, we think of. We think of genetics and sleep disturbances. We think of environmental toxins, but sometimes we forget about the potential interactions and depletions that might occur from the interactions of the medications that might be on board. Now, there are going to be various um, PDFs and databases. I've given you a list of resources at the end of this webinar that you can look at, but there's going to be quite a few different ones you can look at. And what you'll find across the board is you'll find very similar, similar categories of drugs that can actually create some of these depletions. 
This is not a complete list here by any means, but I put some of the most common ones that we might see in our practices and in our clients and patients. So we have the antacids, the antibiotics, antidepressants, blood pressure medication, of course, cholesterol lowering medications, diuretics, and then um, hormones and oral contraceptives. As you look at this list, you probably have seen most of these in your practice at some time or another within your clients. Because of the time and how much goes into thinking about each one of these, we're actually just gonna take one, which is the antacids, the acid blockers, um, particularly the proton pump inhibitors, and we're gonna dive deep into it and really understand the mechanism so we can see that as we come back out of each category, we have to do the same for each one of these different groups of medication to really understand them. So we're gonna jump into antacids, acid blockers, and PPIs. As you know, these are typically prescribed for reflux, um, GERD, and heartburn, so different uh, terminology depending on what they're dealing with. There's antacids, um, many of these are over the counters. There's also prescription H2 blockers, and then there's our proton pump inhibitors. And when you look at the two highlighted, blue highlighted, um, products here, you see the omeprazole, which is the Prilosec. This is actually the eighth most frequently prescribed medication in the U.S. And you don't actually have to have a prescription. This is, comes in both uh, prescription form as well as over-the-counter, and it's available branded and generic. And then we also have Nexium, right, our purple pill. So this is the highest retail sales in 2010 was of this particular branded drug sold in the United States. So you can see you will probably run into this, I would say frequently in your practice and in the future. This is, this slide here is a lot of words to say in short that we're using a lot of PPIs. It's making someone a lot of money and it potentially is creating a lot of issues uh, in our healthcare system. And the underlying issue, which is GERD, is going up, which we can probably then anticipate that the prescription number will continue to rise as well. So it's not going away. We need to understand it. Um, we were thinking of playing this particular video for you, but I, I'm not sure it was going to play very well. Um, and we decided as a Hawthorne team to give you the URL for it instead. So it's about two and a half minutes. Um, if you can, take a couple minutes after this uh, webinar and uh, watch this video so that you can actually see how a PPI works in the body. What you see on the right hand side is a uh, screenshot of, I, I'm hoping you can see my cursor here, if not you can follow my words, but a PPI, uh, I'm sorry, the parietal cells create hydrochloric acid um, and the way that happens is through the, the exchange of some ions through this yellow channel that's on the right hat side of the parietal cell. So we see that potassium will actually be exchanged for a hydrogen and potassium will go into the parietal cell and the hydrogen will come out of the parietal cell. And as you can see here, the H, the hydrogen, will bind to the Cl, the chloride, and we will have acid. So when this happens too much, at too high frequency or in, in too high quantities, we start to have the symptoms of GERD. So what a PPI does, a, a proton pump inhibitor, it actually, it, its downstream effect is to block this channel right here on the right-hand side, the yellow channel in the parietal cell, um, and can actually irreversibly bind, or it does irreversibly bind for up to 18 hours. So when somebody takes the Nexium or the Prilosec, they're, they're kind of, they're feeling good for a while, probably till the next day. Uh, but what it also does is potentially set them up for not having enough hydrochloric acid in the stomach. And you're gonna see next why that is um, detrimental to downstream health issues. So we can see that blocking the acid secretion from the parietal cells can lead to an actual B12 depletion because B12 is, is, requires acid to be able to be absorbed from the food. We can also see a magnesium depletion in clients and patients who are taking the PPIs, as well as zinc. So, you know, somebody has a depletion, is that really a big deal? Well, let's take a look at what these particular nutrients do in the body. We're not gonna go through it all, because as you can see, just looking at zinc, 
there's quite a bit that this particular nutrient does. So you can see there's quite a host of different areas it will impact if we have a zinc deficiency. There's four categories, if you will, um, that we can talk about when we talk about zinc deficiency. We can look for weakened immunity, thinning hair, skin issues, cognition decline, and lowering of energy levels. So how about magnesium? Well, you probably all know that magnesium is extremely important as well. And so you can see from head to toe, male to female, we need magnesium and magnesium deficiency will impact a whole host of different health systems and, and um, mechanisms. When we look at B12, of course, we absolutely know again that there's um, quite a few areas that B12 is needed within the body from DNA synthesis to methylation. So now we're dealing with reproduction aspects. We're looking at cancer components. We're looking also at methylation, so our neurotransmitters. We're looking at mitochondrial metabolism, so fatigue and energy levels, uh, anemia, and neurological symptoms. Where we see a lot of this B12 deficiency is actually in our geriatric population, and that makes a lot of sense when we think that when we look at uh, the number of geriatric patients that have been given a PPI. And oftentimes, interestingly enough, PPIs are not uh, necessarily supposed to be prescribed long term, but they typically are placed on board for a patient and in most cases end up staying part of their routine uh, medication as a, a daily medication. Um, and if these patients don't go back and are not taken off the PPI, then often it stays on for long term. So what can we do as holistic practitioners when we find out that somebody is on a PPI or that they might be going on a PPI because they have GERD, but they've come to you first because they want other solutions. So we can take a look at what we have in our toolbox to actually support this patient, whether they're already on the PPI or whether they're thinking about going on one. So first of all, we can increase the foods that they would be deficient in. So these would be foods that are rich in zinc, magnesium, and B12. We have a host of different resources to go to to find what those foods might be. We can also consider supplementation. So whether it's we're looking at the RDA for magnesium or for zinc or for B12, again, very easy to find. We have the resources as has holistic practitioners and we should be utilizing them. Now let's say the patient is already on their PPI and you don't think they should be or they're not feeling well on it. Well, what we need to do is work with our practitioner to remove them from it. And in, in some cases, that might take quite some time as coming off of or deprescribing or reducing the dose of a PPI can actually lead to rebound effects. So definitely work with a primary, their primary care physician or whoever has prescribed the PPI in the first place to take them off of it if it's deemed it should come off. The inappropriate removal of, of a PPI, if you haven't, um, controlled the excess acid uh, creation or, or, or uh, secretion is that it can actually uh, cause something called Barrett's esophagus. That is a risk factor for esophageal cancer, it can damage the esophageal lining if there's too much acid. So again, we got to get down to the root cause of, of the excessive acid. And once you do that, then often uh, the PPIs can be reduced in dosage, dosage or deprescribed altogether. And of course, we don't want an upset client, so we want to do this in a, a systematic manner. Let's say our client comes in and they have not actually been on a PPI yet, then we can actually help them through other supportive measures that are in our toolbox by reducing the risk factors of GERD, that's alcohol, caffeine, stress, um, eliminate food sensitivities. We can help them to attain a healthy weight. You can do heel drops with them. All of this is in, in, our, um, in our toolboxes to do, which is really wonderful. There's been visceral manipulation, working with a practitioner who works with hiatal hernias, if that's the underlying cause, sleeping on the left side. And of course, then we have herbs. So here we're getting back to um, why we're talking about uh, GERD and PPIs, which is in some cases, you may find that you would like to recommend a particular herb um, that will help the PPIs. And so in this case, we're gonna look at herbs that uh, reduce secretion of acid or that are demulcents. So they're helping to coat and uh, reduce the symptoms of the excess acid, carminatives to help with digestion of the food, 
or bitters because in some case cases um, the actual GERD can be stimulated through uh, hydrochloric acid, so too little of the hypochloric acid, so we don't have enough. And so bitters can help stimulate naturally um, and increase in HCL. So different herbs we might want to use in these case, this case are, are listed here. And so you can see we might use herbal medicine to support somebody on an acid blocker through either supporting any nutrient deficiencies might, which might be happening because of the, the, the PPI. We might also want to support excessive acid uh, production if they haven't already um, been prescribed the PPI. And so you have a list of herbs that you can use there. But again, always thinking about if you were to put those into their plan, what might the potential interactions look like? That was just one category of antacid acid blockers in a long list of various categories of medication that we should all always be aware of and thinking of. So in summary, when we're looking at utilizing botanical medicines, we again have to think about the drug nutrient interaction uh, with those botanicals. And remembering that there's always a place and a time for virtually all modalities and therapeutics, but that we need to approach each person individually, utilizing the modality that is needed for that person at that time. We need to remember there will, will frequently be polytherapeutics that are occurring. So we might have medications and supplements and botanicals and food all happening in the one individual system at one time, in which case we just need to understand if there's any contraindications or potential interactions. We need to utilize our resources for checking those interactions ahead of time. That is part of our responsibility. Looking for drug depletions and supporting as necessary, and then always educating our clients. So I wanted to give you a list of resources here. Again, we just took a couple of examples, and that's just a drop in the bucket of what the potential interactions are out there. So take a look at some of these uh, reference books. Some of them are a little more expensive than others. Some are more comprehensive, but and some of them are actually online that you can look through. Here are some searchable databases. So for example, if you um, had two different medications and a botanical and a nutri nutritional supplement that were all on board, you could actually click into some of these databases and enter all of those different uh, prescriptions in and recommendations into the database. And it would tell you, here is an interaction, be careful. Here is a, a moderate interaction, watch for anything that might happen. And here's, uh, you know, these don't have any interactions. So these are really great to have on your computer um, saved in your bookmarks. There's also a plethora of guides. These are just a few. So definitely take a look at these so that you can see how much information is out there. And then uh, I'm really excited. We're actually creating a Hawthorne um, cert certificate course coming in 2020. Um, the title will be along the lines of drug nutrient botanical interactions. So we're really excited to be producing that and bringing that forward to the community next year. So I believe that we have finished up. So I hope to see you in the course next year. And here's my email as well as website, but please feel free to contact me if you have any questions on this particular topic. Thank you, Bianca. Just such a beautiful presentation. Just wowed by it. Thank you. So we have some questions, but I wanted to take us back to some of the early slides and the um, 1890s, 59% of the U.S. was using botanicals in some form, and yet we burned our healers, right, aka witches, for using such substances. So, you know, from a very early time, earlier than that, we were um, afraid of certain kinds of healings. Have you wow. seen this? That's a, right? that's a tremendous insight. I, I hadn't gone down that pathway, Paula, and gosh, I guess I need to dig deeper. That that, that really <laughs> is something to consider. Yeah. Um, and then the, the slides on the medical schools and programs and education um, veering away from things that were classified as non-medical. 
it begs the question for you to define what is medical. Mm -hmm. and, and isn't it interesting where the money was being brought in from mm -hmm. to, and, and actually there's a, the, the um, article that I referenced in there a hundred years after the Flexner report. And there's a couple of mm -hmm. other articles that I plan on putting into the, the course or the certification course that we just looked at is um, that several of the foundations that asked for this particular report and funded the report were already part of the medical system, quote unquote, the medical system. Mm -hmm. So I think there was probably a preconceived notion of what was wanted out of this mm -hmm. uh, particular report and it's what they got. Um, so yeah, there, there, there's, there was a lot of politics, a lot of money flowing, and, and I don't know that we will ever truly know everything, but it's interesting how much we lost. Right. Well, there's, there's a distinction I think needs to be made here between the words medical and medicine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. How, how would you define medical? Well, when I think of medical, right, it, it, it would be that more conventional, I think of the, the white room and um, just our, our conventional and not the, not the well, when we say traditional, right? Sometimes mm -hmm. we can see traditional as being the, the herbal and, and foundational medicine, or we can right. think of it now. So that even that word needs to be more defined. So medical to me would be more that conventional medical system, whereas mm -hmm. medicine to me encompasses everything. So medical really is born, <clears throat> and this ideology is born with AMA. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, and it, and it created this whole curriculum that, of like I said, uniformity of the curriculum, and so so in many cases there there was probably some positive, definitely some positives came, that came out of the report, um, as it noted in in one of the articles I was reading, it, it stopped us, you know from bleeding people and, you know, mm -hmm. so there were things that were positive mm -hmm. that came from this, but we might have jumped the gun of getting rid of, you know, the baby with the bathwater. Perhaps, you know, when you say, you know, holism is, it was disappearing, yet, you know, the medications that are being made at that time and currently are based on plants. They're developed mm -hmm. from plants. <laughs> yes. So. Yes, which I think then is interesting how we're seeing this resurgence into, like I said, novel, quote unquote, novel um, products coming from plant medicine, but that that's where the pharmaceutical uh, groups are now starting to orient their, their strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So with a $24 billion market emerging here, um, we're also seeing a lot of products being sold and touted as healthy it is really kind of a snack food you know like mm -hmm. corn chips or popcorn or something and on the label but you know but it has collagen and antioxidants and turmeric in it so it's being marketed as healthy mm -hmm. and still just sprinkles on something that <laughs> isn't otherwise nourishing us very much which i think to, you know for us as healthcare providers it really comes back to part of our responsibility is education. Mm -hmm. So we need to be educated, but we also need to educate those that we see. Because to your point, you know, if somebody says, I eat healthy, but what they're eating is packaged food that says this is a health food, that's entirely different than growing a garden and eating out of your garden healthy. Absolutely, absolutely. So one of the questions was about grapefruit juice, and um, while we've heard a lot about it, it was like they were distinguishing that large quantities was important mm -hmm. to monitor. Do you have you seen in the research what large quantity was referred to as? How much? I don't. Um, but what they showed was that multiple studies were saying it's not just having like a glass here and there. Mm -hmm. It's more, yeah, and I, and I can't give you the quantity, unfortunately. I could go absolutely go back to, to those mm -hmm. papers. Mm -hmm. and that. It just made me wonder if people were drinking, you know, a glass of grapefruit juice first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. And um, if that would be, you know, people have orange juice, some people have grapefruit juice. If that could be, you know, right away, first thing before you take in any other food, um, if, if that was enough. Exactly. So I think we, you know, in that review article I was showing you too, it looked at multiple, um, multiple trials 
and gather different information. So, you know, that's the other part with clinical trials is oftentimes we get several answers and then we have to decide which one's the best or mm -hmm. do we put them all together mm -hmm. and make our, our final recommendation. Yeah. But an interesting um, comment here that I had, had seen when I was reading through some of this literature was that, you know, what if rather than seeing grapefruit juice or um, maybe greens when we get, you know, when, when we're, we've got vitamin K in the greens with warfarin, maybe rather than seeing those as detrimental interactions, what if as a medical community and in, in the research community, what if instead we utilize that to the advantage of the patient to be able to allow, have them eat or drink those particular products and then not having to give as much drug? Right. I mean, that, wow. That's also an That's a win-win. I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> so I just thought, you know, sometimes we have to turn things on its on their heads and, and we have to look at it from the other side mm -hmm. and maybe we can find something that's actually enlightening and helpful. I sure hope so. Um, back to this slide on, on demulsants and thinking that we largely use demulsants in cases of leaky gut. And here is the suggestion is that leaky, that slippery elm can block absorption versus, you know, healing leaky gut, therefore supporting absorption. So there's a little bit of a conflict of understanding there. Can you elaborate on it a little bit, you think? Well, I think to most sense, we're, we're really looking at, in terms of the interaction, if it's blocking something, it I mean, I, I don't know the mechanism because I don't think that we've probably ever totally looked at, you know, some of these and how they're either interacting for the leaky gut component or for, uh, or for the purposes of, of blocking medications being absorbed. Mm -hmm. But I, I think in, in my brain when I'm looking at it, a demulcent would actually be helpful to not just coating the intestinal tract, but supporting the healing of it. So that would probably be a really great thing when we're, when we're looking at it from that perspective. Um, but just understanding if there's medication on board, that that might also be hampering the absorption of the medication. Well done, thank you. Um, question, what are heel drops? Heel drops are, uh, it's an interesting, I, I haven't recommended it very often, but we learned it as an op option um, in school is if you have somebody with a hiatal hernia mm -hmm. and you want to bring it back down through through the, the opening, the, the hiatal hernia down again, mm -hmm. that you can drink water and the mechanism is that the water goes into the, the bottom of the stomach into that area and you, I'm trying to do this so you, but you can't see me, um, is you're, <laughs> you're beginning on let's say uh, a small step mm -hmm. here at the balls of your toes and then you drop down with your heels and it's it's almost the okay. physical maneuver of the, I see. The bringing it back suck down. it down suck it back in <laughs> yeah so just you know kind of using gravity and, and the weight of the water to bring things back down to where they should be thank you mm -hmm. um back with um things we can do when we suspect that there's a a drug nutrient um, depletion. One of the options was lab testing. What labs would you suggest or something like that? So that's a great, great question. So in most cases, what I would look, well, there would be two ways that I would approach it as a naturopathic doctor. Uh, number one, I'm going to see what their complaints are, right? I'm going to take a full history. I'm going to do my physical exam. And so if I see things indicating to me that they might have anemia or they might have um, an immune deficiency, then in addition to my normal lab testing and you know, the run of the mill CBC, CMP, I might also add in additional testing for maybe zinc or you know, copper or, or even RBC magnesium. So mm -hmm. then I would get more specific based on both the physical exam sign and symptoms, but also if they were on a medication, mm -hmm. that's where I'm going to use my resources to look up mm -hmm. what might be occurring and mm -hmm. test for the Okay, so you test for these nutrients with a blood test versus a spectra cell or something like that. Um, I think spectra cells blood as well, mm -hmm. if I'm not. Yeah, it mistaken. is. But just to yeah. you know, it's more of a full panel than looking at things individually. 
but but it's you know every practitioner will do something different okay um you know it, it will be based not only on the individual and the practitioner but their insurance or their ability to pay you know so all all of those factors will come into um to play there but each nutrient there will be a reference on the best way to test it so it's not that every nutrient should be tested in the same manner some mm -hmm. might be different some might be serum or plasma or whatnot mm -hmm. all right thanks mm -hmm. So I think the the um, last point here that really got my attention was that um, antacids were the high, that Nexium was the highest retail sales of anything, um, and given that you know with with our attention to pain, you know, I would think that it would be aspirin or some other kind of pain medication, but really you know an antacid Nexium acts as a pain medication you know as it blocks the pain of the uh, uh, of the excess acid mm -hmm. so it's just it was interesting to me that that would be the highest retail sell of any drug yeah highest retail branded drug in 2010 i believe so yeah it is something i mean everybody's got heartburn right but but when you look at the root cause of it it really comes back to our lifestyle medicine components let's look right. at what you're thinking. And, and we also have to question, you know, is it is it excess acid in the first place or is it low acid? Exactly. exactly. Right? Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and again, it all comes, are you chewing your food? Are you eating mm. your foods? Are you eating at the right time of the day for you? Are you mm. stressing when you're eating? Are you yeah. on the car when you're eating? And it's just, right? And that's what our job is as clinicians is to uncover what is happening, even though we might have five people with GERD, they may all have GERD for a different reason, but they all might be on PPIs. So we have to backtrack and we have to see why they're having the GERD and then go right. from to support right. them. Right, always looking at the fundamentals of health. You know, what is what what is the food being taken? What's the movement? What's their stress? What's their sleep? You know, what's their lifestyle like, et cetera. Always, 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 yeah. always. always, always. All right, beautiful presentation. I appreciate this so much. I'm looking forward to the course. There's so much for us to learn. <laughs> and thank oh, you for bringing this there? to us today, right? <laughs> so much. <laughs> so much so that I'll remind everybody that um, the value of this webinar and that it was recorded, it'll be available on the Hawthorne, Hawthorne website under archived webinars in just a few days with a plethora of other webinars for that we've been doing over the years. And a reminder that as this webinar closes, a survey will pop up for you, and it sure helps us to have your feedback. Any comments, anything that you have to say about this presentation, I'll sure appreciate you taking the time to do that, take a few minutes for it. And I want to let you know that our next upcoming webinar on November 5th, we have Dr. Liz Lipsky returning, and she's going to be presenting on the power of the right diet in digestive and immune issues. And our next All About Alumni graduate interview is on November, November 6th um, with our Master's of Science and Traditional Nutrition graduate, Katie Lambert, who's going to be presenting on her post-graduation activities and her accomplishments and certainly her challenges will not be uh, left out of that one. And for this also, we've had so many previous terrific grad interview presentations, so I encourage you to check out our archives on that as well. And if we've inspired you to learn more about health and nutrition with all the webinars that we've offered over the years, and certainly this one, I'll remind you that Hawthorne University provides a variety of nourishing programs and courses, so I encourage you to visit our website for more detail. And when you're ready for more personalized attention, Lizette Picasso is our terrific admissions advisor. All right, I think with all that said, I'm going to conclude today's presentation. And just thank you again, Dr. Grilly, so much. Well, thank you for having me, Paula. I, it was very enjoyable, and I, I personally learned a lot. All right. And that's always a good thing, right? Thank you, everybody, for sharing this educational experience with us. And I wish you the best of health. And sure look forward to learning more together in Hawthorne's webinar and All About Alumni series and with all of our programs, too. So until then, let's practice tending our drug, nutrient, and herbal interactions, and, and certainly happiness and compassion and kindness, too, because what we practice grows stronger. Thank you for joining me in this webinar and in this endeavor to be healthy. Take good care. <laughs>